In the early 60s, America was a colorless place. Everything was just so. Straight lines, straight values, straight shooters. And there was hardly any fun. Then came Keezy and LSD. Nobody knew what to make of Ken Kesey and his merry pranksters, but by the end of their trip, America was a very different place. Happy 420, man. Happy Arbor Day. Happy Hitler's birthday. Whatever you celebrate out there. This is Nick's Nonfiction. I am Nick Muniz. Today on the show, we have got the electric Kool-Aid acid test. Buckle up. This is the American road trip done by America's most able-bodied acid aficionados. We're talking about a time where peace prevailed. Let your freak flag fly. Don't bogart my joint, man. <laughs> Bro, I hate hippies for making fun of everybody today, including myself. I live in Boulder. Another one. Boulder! Are you fucking kidding me? I know this culture inside out. One of my many points today will be, if we listened to the kids in the 60s, maybe we could have prevented a few Malai massacres. But the bigger point, culture is controlled. Quote, sometimes we don't even realize what we really care about because we get so distracted by the symbols. Me. The hippie movement, it's now associated with hipsters wearing Birkenstocks, their wool knit beanies from independently owned coffee shops. These crunchy motherfuckers. They have the same mission as me, make love not war. Well, for some reason they're okay with starting a nuclear war over the Ukraine. <laughs> Isn't it weird that the only anti-war people are anarchists? <laughs> what the fuck? Goddamn scene core punksters. Have your man bun if it makes you feel good. As long as you hate the Fed, you're invited to the party. This is where everyone fails listening to Nick's nonfiction. Don't pick a camp, okay? We make fun of everybody. Quote, Aldous Huxley compared the brain to a reducing valve. Fellow academic Aldous? Fuck you. In ordinary perception, the sense sends an overwhelming flood of information to the brain, which the brain then filters down to a trickle it can manage for the purpose of survival. We've known this for millions of years. You eat ergot, and then you burn a witch. You can see women's evil intentions. Okay, we'll start making sense again. I don't take Aldous Huxley serious because we've learned on the Patreon this guy, Al Hubbard, was the Johnny Appleseed for the CIA. He dosed Aldous Huxley, hit him hard. I'm not letting my guard down, bro. These people, <laughs> the whole 60s was an MK Ultra experiment. But that quote got right. Normies are becoming utilitarians as a reaction. So the trickle becomes more pale. All of this hippie bullshit, it, they're confusing you. Our culture is being spit-roasted from the left and the right. And we're talking about hippies today. Sam Harris, that's your god. He's convinced hippies to think that they're dirt. You're on the peace pipe all day and you have zero spirituality? <laughs> Been fooled. The New Age movement, it's a mind fuck, dude. I'm here to navigate the culture. One more quote. It's like a boulder rolling down a hill. You could watch it and talk about it and scream and say shit, but you can't stop it. It's just a question of where it'll go. Maybe you can stop it. You know, if you take acid before a dubstep concert, it wears off. The bass neutralizes the acid. <laughs> it's been scientifically proven that John Lennon did so much LSD in the 60s that he fell in love with Yoko Ono. <laughs> took my driving test high on LSD. Passed with flying colors. <laughs> Ladies and germs, we'll be right back. At reality, at life, 
without doing anything to it, without any sense of hurry, without any wish to improve it, just let it happen. And you can understand then why Buddha images look blissful. About the author Tom Wolf, Harry should on Instagram, patreon.com slash the niche. Born 1930 in Richmond, Virginia, Tom Wolf was an American author and journalist widely known for his association with new journalism, a style of news writing and journalism developed in the 60s and 70s that incorporated literary techniques. I guess that's opposed to gonzo journalism in the 70s. Take as many drugs as possible and try to survive. <laughs> 70s rule, 60s drool. We'll get in the weeds today. Quote, Upon graduation in 1947, he turned down admission to Princeton University to attend Washington and Lee. At Washington and Lee, Wolf was a member of the Phi Kappa Sigma Phi Piggy Piggy. Majored in English, was a sports editor, and then he worked as a regional newspaper reporter for the 50s. Went on this trip in the 60s. Well-known author by the 70s. What happens when you take too much LSD? Acid reflux. <laughs> Be right back with the show. For many, Altamont spelled the end of the 60s. Over the next 30 years, the magic bus and the acid tests passed into American folklore. And the trip was gradually drained of its radical message. Corporate America tries to use like hippie and psychedelic images to sell their real kind of like awful cheese ball products. You know, like the idea that if you put a smiley or a picture of a VW camper van with flowers painted on it, that you'll sell more margarine or something. People also, they, they just, they, they latch onto the surface things of it. Long hair and Afghan coats and stuff rather than anything to do with the and even the message of it gets simplified down to, yeah, you walk around doing this. Which I think it probably was a bit deeper than that. And, it, and because of all that kind of rubbish that grows up on top of it, then the central message that it would be better if people did love each other a bit more and that there was peace, that kind of becomes, you know, it's almost like you feel a bit stupid saying it. You, you, you feel a bit, you feel a bit embarrassed to say it but I do think that it would be not a bad idea, you know. I'm on a good cushion alcohol. Tom Wolfe's Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, Chapter 1, Black Shiny FBI Shoes. Author Tom Wolfe riding in the back of a pickup truck through San Francisco with a ragtag group of acid heads. They call themselves the Merry Pranksters. Suck. <laughs> They're on their way to the warehouse. It's just outside San Francisco. It's an abandoned pie factory. They use it as their headquarters. Wolf was a New York journalist at the time. He'd come to San Francisco to meet Ken Kesey. He's the leader of the pranksters. And for the readers out there, he wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I'll have a theory about that later. Kesey was arrested twice for marijuana possession. So he fled to Mexico January 1966. And eight months later, he returned to the States where they arrest him on site. The lawyer was able to get him a deal on bail, but Ken had to go on TV to, quote, tell the youth to stop taking LSD because it was dangerous and would fry their brains. So, like, that's how powerful narratives are. They'll let this international criminal out if he goes on TV 
and lies about drugs. And again, yes, if you take a god dose every fucking weekend, you're done. <laughs> but just think about how powerful narratives are, bro. It's more powerful than law and criminal justice, apparently. The only thing I care about is drugs. One, the war on drugs. Damn! Facts. Keezy is a free man. He makes his way to the pie factory, the headquarter of the pranksters. Wolf's been waiting there for a few days, and he's going to write the story about Ken's time in Mexico, so he thinks. Tom notes, There's no running water in the derelict building. I use the restroom as a gas station down the street. For the pranksters, this is permanent. This is the way they live. Journalist Tom. Quote, After hanging around the merry pranksters for so long, I called it Misto. This is what Tom is calling his introduction to all the psychedelic. Misto which likens to esteem rising in the head. This guy's been there for a day and he thinks he's seeing auras. I'm starting to believe, like the pranksters, that everybody's life is significant and full of meaning. <coughs> that quote made me cry. See, he's, he has zero mysticism for life. The magic is dead for this New York reporter. But I'm starting to believe, like the pranksters, that life might have meaning. <laughs> He goes, now I know this is a feeling in my head because people aren't special. They're taxpayers. He doubled down on this quote. I already kind of... We're brushing off the fact that he's standing in a fucking psychedelic interdimensional rift. The abandoned pie factory where everybody's getting high. This guy's definitely secondhand already. You could get high off of people in places, not just LSD, dude. Hey, bro, watch your jet. Watch your jet, bro. Watch your jet! It's a whole... A uh, plot which we won't have to mess around with because I want to talk about 60s culture. Ken is going to relive the magic. Got a big quote here. The pranksters were acid heads, or heads for short. The defining trait of acid heads is the love of LSD. It's incredibly potent, and a trip or acid experience can last up to 12 hours. Some trips are pleasant, others are terrifying. The pranksters believe that LSD opened unused parts of the mind, thereby allowing users to gain deeper understanding of their lives and the surrounding world. They also thought taking acid as a group allowed them to sync up and share thoughts. This book fucking rules. They've done couple trips in labs under scientific studies, and motherfuckers have the same dream. All this is going to sound like psychobabble today. Sync up, bitch. <laughs> Quote, The best shoes are those that belong to the acid heads. Most light, fanciful boots, handcrafted are best. Low-cut shoes like sneakers and dress shoes are unhip. So they were saying that Doc Martens were the ultimate hippie shoes. And that's where the name of the chapter came from. Black shiny FBI shoes. More pranksters are arriving at the pie factory. Some of the legends include Ken Babs, a, a Vietnam vet. Clean cut George Walker, he's more of a beatnik. Paul Foster is this other guy. Wolf's Eye. You're going to meet more of the gang. The Hell's Angels start showing up. This book gets sick. And then... I'm Pickle Rick! <laughs> Ken Kesey enters the house. <laughs> Chapter 2, Pranksters Assemble! There's got to be like a, a Thor hippie. He basically was the hippie in those movies. I'm thinking of a Hulk hippie. <laughs> That's basically Ken Kesey. You'll see he's unhinged. He is Nicholson in the cuckoo's nest. But it's kind of weird the way he's telling all these acid heads... Man, the people in the system, they aren't people. So it's almost like he's militarizing them, which raises a lot of spook flags in my mind. This chapter begins. Keezy enters and tells the assembled pranksters about jail and how he was too afraid to help a kid who had fallen out a window and hate Asbury. He's got a bunch of stories. Keezy becomes upset when a reporter questions him about whether it's a good idea to graduate from acid. He denies working against the acid community and explains how the I Ching told him when one reaches the end of something, another thing begins. Fuck this guy. He's roping them back in with Eastern <laughs> tautologies. This one kid is like, I think I've done enough acid. And Keys is like, no, stay at the pie factory forever. <laughs> Moments later, Ken Kesey goes outside during an electrical storm and felt as though he had a second skin of lightning and electricity. So Ken, uh, even the writer Tom Wolfe is buying into the hype. 
And it's because he came and dropped a bunch of stories about the Yakuza and whatever. Like, they, he's, Tom's saying, this is how all the pranksters knew they had faith to go further. <laughs> Ken, he's trying to start a cult. So Tom starts digging into his past. He went to Stanford. People called him a hick with intellectual yearnings. Kesey volunteered in 1959 to take part in medical experiments at veteran hospitals in Menlo Park. He was MK Ultra. My suspicions are confirmed. But I'm still keeping an open mind. The focus is on psychomimetic drugs, which cause temporary states resembling psychokinesis. So kind of like McVeigh and some of these people that get toasted and then just let back out on the streets. The Kesey earned $75 a day for popping pills and letting doctors observe him. <laughs> I almost signed up for something like this in Austin, Texas. Quote, before long, Kesey, maybe I did it and they wiped my mind. Kesey and Lovell have tried all the drugs the study offers. LSD, mescaline, IT290, morning glory seeds, the white smocks, which inadvertently gave Kesey and Lovell the key to open locked doors of the mind. <laughs> The overall effects is that of liberating the characters and reducing valve of the mind. You can't control it. That's why I'm laughing. These motherfuckers are trying to sound like superheroes. They had as many bad trips as they were able to astral project into Russian nuclear bunkers. So I'm thinking this guy got fucking MK Ultra. He's with that Huxley, Huxley fed school of thought. They say he was working night and day as an attendant at a veteran's hospital. Whatever, nobody's fucking keeping score. <laughs> now that Ken Kesey's back in town, the pranksters are fortifying the pie factory. And with no musical talent, they think they're going to record a record. Quote, high on LSD, they record everything from impromptu monologues to freeform association games. On thousands of mics of LSD and doing improv day after day, they still can't spark a creative bug. <laughs> You took too much, bro. So things start getting out of control. Former Marine Ken Bobbs, who comes up with the idea of pulling pranks on society, and benign book inspired con man Mike Hagel, who sets up a sex shack, local residents are perplexed by the ninnies and constant parties at the factory. So this guy Ken Bobbs is coming up with flash mob humor, basically. And Ken makes a rule that no one can leave the factory with the drugs. He's taking some precautions. The parties keep getting more grandiose, more out of control. Wolf calls him a real-life Dean Moriarty. This guy from Jack Kerouac on the road. It's going to come back later on. He goes, wait a minute. That's a good idea, Tom. And apparently this is where he comes up with the idea for the electric Kool-Aid acid test. The bus is born. It's 1964. And they bought a 1939 International Harvester school bus. Sandy Lehman is recruited to come on the bus because he's able to like rig it up with all this electrical stuff. He can put speakers on the inside and outside. The destination sign they put at the front of the bus reads, Further. And the sign at the back reads, Caution. Weird load. <laughs> They put a spinner at the front of the bus, so if they come to an intersection, they could flick it and play Twister. Keezy dubs himself the non-navigator. <laughs> and this amphetamine hound, Neil Cassidy, becomes the driver. Quote, everyone finds their own role and the journey begins. What they are and whatever they were. Paul Sudson had a microphone blasting out ghoulish laughing noises and started singing, doing his own thing as the group drives towards San Jose. <laughs> Chapter 3. According to Tom, there's two groups on the bus. The inner circle, it's composed of those closest to Keezy. They have the access to the best LSD. So it's all hippie egalitarianism. <laughs> but it's already choosing favorites. The outer circle is expected to say stay sober and film. So they don't do that. By like week one, everybody is high all the time, talking nonsense, confusion, mayhem. Keezy's motto becomes, you're either on the bus or off the bus. More of this divisive rhetoric. Hippies will be friends with anyone. Keezy is turning into this like angry acid head. He's probably getting some speed from the driver, Cassidy. Crystal meth Cassidy. Something. 
I don't know, man. We're not going to beat the National Guard in a battle. Angry hippie is not the way to go. It's all about civil disobedience, what the Marine was saying. Ken Babs? Infiltrate and derail. Ken Kesey is sounding like some sort of a Manson character. Hey, leftists, dye your hair purple and be mad at everybody. <laughs> Women's rights derailed. One guy brings a chick on the bus called Stark Naked. She was a maniac one minute and catatonic the next. Following Kesey's pre-trip orders of letting everyone be who they are, do their own thing, the other pranksters don't intervene as the behavior becomes more erratic. Three days later, when they arrive in Houston at novelist Larry McCountry's, Stark Naked jumps out of the bus and sweeps up McCurdy's little boy, confusing him for her own. That's when they realize she's gone stark raving mad. This bitch wasn't crazy to begin with. <laughs> bus member Sandy Lehman... The technician, he starts to cause problems. He loathes Ken Kesey, but also loves him. Desperate for his approval, but constantly wanting to end the trip. He nearly breaks down in Pensacola, Florida, after Kesey refuses to guide him through a bad trip by unauthorized acid. So Kesey's saying, you took acid that I didn't give you? You're out of the commune. <laughs> Ken Babs, Paul Sundren. A couple more people come on the bus. Paula Sunston. Gretchen Fetchin, <laughs> some dope hippie chicks. We're all one brain out here, and we're all one bus. <laughs> On the way to New York, the bus stops to meet Jack Kerouac. It was pretty uneventful, one quote I found. Though both Kesey and Kerouac's beliefs are rooted in straying from societal norms, neither has much to say to one another. Okay, so the leaders in the Beaknit cultures were Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, and the fucking psycho William Burroughs. We've read all of their shit. From what I've read in the deeper stuff, Allen Ginsberg was the inside man, CIA, and Jack Kerouac couldn't be controlled, so Allen Ginsberg shoved his hand up the gaping gay ass of William Burroughs. Now it's Ginsberg's puppet. So this is like Keezy with some of the figures in the 60s. When they arrive in New York City in mid-July, Keezy and Ken Babs get on top of the bus and tootie the people. They say people were broken outside of the comatose of the outside world by the music. However, people reacted differently, scared, delighted, confused. That's however they were playing their instruments. Kind of interesting. The pranksters head to Millbrook, New York, meet up with Timothy Leary there, his group, which they called the League of Spiritual Discovery. The bus blasts onto the grounds in a blur of loud music and green smoke bombs. The pranksters anticipate a warm welcome, but the Learyites aren't interested in them. Neither is Leary, who sends word he can't see them. <laughs> the Learyites take several pranksters on a tour of part of the estate, but the cool reception prompts Ken Babs and the others to mock the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which Leary's group reveres. We've read that here. YouTube pushed the shit out of that. <laughs> the first bardo and the second bardo. These people want you to take god doses frequently. Stop it. So you guys are just like moving from one life to the next, and then the next, and then the next forever? That sounds peaceful. Having everyone that you've grown to love wiped away from your memory time after time? Bro, it's a test, but you don't get to keep the knowledge for the next test. Namaste. One of the Learyites offers Ken Kesey nausea-inducing morning glory seeds instead of LSD. So the pranksters go back on the bus, hit the road, they take care of Ken Kesey. He's mortal, just like us. Quote, the LSD almost gone from the pranksters followed the northern route back to California. So most of them switch over to methamphetamines in the meantime. Kesey, dog shit shaman. This is back in California, chick Sandy's losing her grip. When she sleeps, she dreams about fighting with Keezy. <laughs> she finally freaks out and tells the group everything during a game called Power. Realizing Sandy is in a bad way, the pranksters shower her with love and affection, which Sandy misinterprets as malice. Before long, she's sure the others are trying to kill her. The police find her one night knocking on the doors and screaming that she's going to jump off a cliff. One lap around the country down... Only one prankster is casualty. Pretty decent. Now rumors are starting to spread from the last trip, and Ken Kesey is ready to plan another. Holy 
Holy crap! Chapter 4, Hell's Angels. Things are starting to get cosmic, says Tom Wolfe. They won't discuss the mysticism with anyone but him at times. And they're experiencing what they call intersubjectivity. It's an interaction among separate conscious minds. It's Boulder, Colorado. It's a hippie hive mind. Quote, the world was simply and sheerly divided into the unaware and those who had the experience of being vessels of the divine. A grand mass of the unaware, the unmusical and unattuned. The, like, they just need to, like, snoke a bow and then think about what specs we are in the universe. <laughs> He's a fucking idiot. The book turns into garbage philosophy, bro. Kesey is militarizing these people. He's destroying the good nature of hippies. <laughs> There's the underwear in the way. Fucking retarded. Hippies are supposed to be like Jesus, friends with hookers and homeless people. Anybody. Ken is breeding elitist hippies. That's what we have now and why everybody fucking hates it. Even the most asleep people have moments where the light is shining through. You can't write the population off, homie. I'm saying he's not actually trying to make change. He's trying to divide the subcultures. You get the Learyites over here and the pranksters over here. You'll see it play out more. Bro, it's glowy shit. <laughs> Quote, the pranksters don't have a philosophy or goal. But I insist the atmosphere around them is religious in nature. And the pranksters aren't just forming a movement. They're building a religion. <laughs> this isn't that deep. Anything could be a religion if you classify the symbols, the rituals, the beliefs. I'm trying to say this dude's breaking up the subculture. There's all these unspoken rules arising. But Ken is refusing to admit that he's still the leader. <laughs> Trust me, guys, it's totally egalitarian, even though I control all the acid. It's not Calvinism, even though I pick an inner circle of aristocrats. Tom Wolf, he's trying to vill villainize Ken now. So he's finally getting involved in the drama. Ken Babs take his side on it. And Ken Babs starts taking time out in the forest. This is the Marine, and his psychedelic activity of choice was painting trees neon. That's like last year, probably this exact day, I put out a video where I painted a tree. I didn't even know I was doing hippie bullshit. Felt pretty good. He's right. <laughs> Along with synchronicities, Ken is figuring out his lag time. He describes it as the space between basically when you hear some bullshit and when you learn the lesson. But if you want to get real acid with it, he's basically singing bullet time. Homies in the metaverse. Quote, Consequently, no one is really ever in the present. We are all doomed to spend our lives watching a movie of ourselves. <laughs> it's so retarded. The hippies pretend to be the most present people. Shut the fuck up. Late 1964, the police start surveilling the property and chasing Ken around town. Aware of the surveillance, the pranksters post a sign alluding to an upcoming party. So the cops raid on that specific date. The pranksters had no drugs. Hello, and welcome to the Los Pollos Hermanos family. Ken is running a type shit. Type shit. <laughs> Quote, more young people flock to Kesey's property in search of their own beautiful people. The cops are drumming up the support. It's the Hells Angels book all over again. The media wants some action. Quote, August 7th, 1965, the Hells Angels descend upon Ken Kesey's property for two days of beer and drug-fueled mayhem. Everyone was afraid of them, even the police. But not Kesey. He was introduced to some of the Angels by Hunter S. Thompson. They all take a liking to Ken. Wolf was calling it an obscene clot of degradation. <laughs> Kesey was dancing naked on the porch. A bunch of women were organizing sex parties. And Allen Ginsberg showed up. He starts chanting Hindu verses over the microphone. Fucking Ginsburg. After this quintessential 60s bash, the angels start palling around with the pranksters. So Kesey's kind of making moves, trying to get protection from the uh, cops. 
And this is when they're going to have to clip Keezy's wings. He's starting to think he's a real boy. Parties that follow not as big, the Young Turks start showing up and they call Ken a prophet. So seriously, some of the subcultures are linking up. Ken Keezy's about to be a target. <laughs> Ken makes a speech to the pranksters before the next trip out. We're not on the Christ trip. That's been done. And it doesn't work. <laughs> Chapter 5. 60s Shenanigans. The Beatles are touring around America. The pranksters are going to the show. They say the stadium felt like a concentration camp. They can only party out in open fields. Free-range grass-fed venues. Woodstock. Rumor has it this guy named Owsley is at the show. He's one of the best acid cooks on the West Coast. So the pranksters go through every seat in the stadium looking for him. And they spread word throughout the whole time. Yo, 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 the Beatles are going to be at the pie factory at the show. <laughs> it got busted immediately. And there's rumors that the Beatles were there, but nobody knows. <laughs> and then like the following week, Ken Kesey was invited to Berkeley to do an anti-war speech. So now he's speaking to 20,000 graduates. How does this make sense? He's a wanted man. Quote, this is what he said to the audience. We're not going to stop this war with this rally by marching. It's all part of their game, which has been going on for thousands of years. Then he pulled out a harmonica and played Home on the Range. <laughs> Ended the speech with this one. There's only one thing to do. Turn your backs and say, F it. It's just controlled opposition, bro. He gives such a mixed message. There was truth and untruth in there. I have to make another classification. There's controlled opposition who knows they're controlled, and then there's the people who don't. And the ones who don't know they're controlled are the best because they could preach their half-wit message better. Motherfucking Keezy. He starts dating this 18-year-old mountain girl, and she gets pregnant with his baby. <laughs> so they head back on the road. She's probably like fucking 14, and that's why they head back on, out on the road. Half his face, he said, was paralyzed from trying to combine speed and DMT. So the spirit molecule and the devil's pop rocks. <laughs> the fuck are you doing? <laughs> he said this helped him come up with the concept of the acid test, a giant party where people are encouraged to take LSD and embark on a voyage of the self. So the pranksters are supposed to be the guides. <laughs> First test happens after a Rolling Stones concert, December 4th, 1965. The Grateful Dead play their first gig with the pranksters in an old hulk of a house. 400 people show up high on acid. Keezy's like, this is what was wrong. There are no sober people allowed next time. <laughs> they start going gorilla with some of the parties. Stinson beaches in California, a ton of surfer acid heads hang out there. The Grateful Dead show up to play. The Hell's Angels bring strobe lights, and the cops never come. Like, if you're deep into the music conspiracies, this is where the Grateful Dead had an acid cook. I'm gonna keep the story going. Owsley, the East Coast cook, was still with them. He had a bad trip on the beach party. As the story goes, he entered a second temporal dimension. He ended up in a fragmented 18th century that tore his body apart until he was a single cell and the rest of the world started to disintegrate. He ran into his car, smashed it into a tree, immediately sobered up. He poured all of his drug money into the Grateful Dead from then on and was like, I'm sober. I want a piece of the business, though. And so then the sound of the Grateful Dead, they start going into like rock jazz. In January 1966, people like the music more. They start what's called the Trips Festival. <laughs> and, like, LSD was still illegal at this time. And the, everybody's showing up. Again, the Learyites are coming to party. So there's something that's linking all these people. And in 1968, acid is made illegal. Yes. Within weeks, the events promoter Bill Graham was hosting a Trips Festival every weekend. So this didn't stop them. They start going to the Haight-Asbury. And this is kind of what starts up before the Manson era. So, like, Manson is just <laughs> the second iteration of this, but they cooked them a little bit too much. So, yeah, the Learyites show up. They call it the most famous test. 
Marquise at this point, he absconds to Mexico <laughs> to dodge a five-year sentence because it's illegal they could start putting charges on him. February 12, 1966, the most famous acid test occurs. It's in the African-American hood called Watts in Los Angeles. The pranksters fill two garbage cans full of Kool-Aid and lace one of it with a hearty dose of LSD. So all these unsuspecting visitors are drinking spiked punch all day <laughs> in this overwhelming dreamland of heightened perception in the hood. One woman has a disastrous trip and goes berserk. Some pranksters try to soothe her while others broadcast her screams over a microphone. <laughs> Nothing bad happens. But without a leader, the pranksters are starting to get more sloppy. We should have handled it this way. Bigger picture, Mr. Illuminati is saying shut it the fuck down. Chapter 6, End of the Road. While in Mexico, Kesey spends most of his time drinking, smoking, and writing letters to Larry McMurty. He calls him a friend in Santa Cruz, California. And so he has some sort of a connection to the States. Mountain Girl, Ken Kebabs, Gretchen Fetchin, George Walker, and Faye head to Mexico to find Ken. Mountain Girl is like eight months pregnant. All the locals are shouting Diablo at the red bus. <laughs> the gang is tripping so hard at one point that they think they're in hell. The sky was red, their eyes were burning, and then a local tells them that the red tide was in Manzillo. The air starts burning your lungs and shit. <laughs> they probably bought it to Mexico. They get to Ken's apartment. He shows up two days later, all dirty. He's been sleeping in the woods. <laughs> Mountain Girl decides to go out and stay with him in the woods. I thought it was going to be like a Nazareth scene and she gives birth out there. But some more symbolism, they start reading the Bible and Nietzsche's Eat together. That'll come back up. Sandy, Neil Cassidy, they come down to make the rescue as well. They're like Esquire magazine wants us to write a number. So again, they have corporate interests. Everyone's down there partying, getting messed up. LSD, dexedrine, opium. Kesey decides it's time to go beyond acid. <laughs> Quote, we will all emerge as superheroes, closing the door behind us and soar into a hole in the sky. This is what happens when you mix acid and Nietzsche. There's no shortcut to Ubermensch. Ken is like done chasing the dragon after he does some more drugs. On their way to Guadalajara, Ken Kesey, Mike Megan, Ram Rod, they're stopped by Mexican police and they find marijuana in the truck. So Kesey pretends he has to pee and then bolts for a passing train. The police are shooting at him. He ends up in Guadalajara with no money and nowhere to go. A couple days pass. He appears in the American consulate. Tell him he's a broke fisherman so they give him money to go back to America. <laughs> he's leaving a pretty easy trail for the FBI to follow. It's the same end as on the road uh, Dean Moriarty in Mexico. Quote, by early October 1966, everyone is in Haight-Asbury and knows Ken Ke Kesey is back, even the police, who are again playing the cops and robbers game with him. Haight-Asbury has changed since Ken Kesey fled. It's now a mecca for hippy dippies with Jesus hair and acid heads with huge zombie eyes just staring. <laughs> I'm telling you, bro, by late 60s, what they called the summer of love, everybody was cooked out. I think the building of the counterculture of the beatniks had it right. I'm going to keep a clean shaved shit chin, but not do any business with the system. And by this point, <laughs> they derailed it. Tom Wolf, he's calling it the hate Asbury probation generation. And he's going, you guys like to protest, but you're still behind the law. Quote, most acid heads aren't into the pudding, still playing roles of middle class intellectuals. They wouldn't jump off the cliff when given the chance to fly. Keezy only winds up serving five days in jail when they catch him. It's like reading Chaos, the Charles Manson book again. He gets taken in and let scot free a hundred times. That's not how the criminal justice system works. Keezy appears on another television show titled The Dangers of LSD. <laughs> so he really took the deal this time. And one of the parts on the show, he goes, Never trust a prankster. He went full shill. 
And that's why the Hells Angels are kings. They don't let any bullshit into their gang. <laughs> October 31st, 1966. The acid test graduation. Certain the event will be a debacle, promoter Bill Graham cancels it the day before. The disappointed pranksters try to regroup, and Kesey convinces them to hold the event in the pie factory. They transform the warehouse into Party Central. On Halloween night, party goers and reporters flock in costumes. Kesey wears white leggings, a white satin cape, and then a red, white, and blue sash across his bare chest. He's insisting everybody goes through the doors and stays until they experience something amazing. <laughs> Quote, the pranksters sit in a circle on the floor holding hands as they wait for the energy to enter them. Onlookers are embarrassed, but everyone in the circle is wrapped. Hours pass. Journalists aren't interested. Guests depart, leaving only the pranksters. It's pretty symbolic, but I took the, the high road of making fun of hippies today. The bigger points, the new hippie leaders in the hate era... They start saying that Kesey was just trying to freak everybody out and trick the cops. So the new leaders are going, the pranksters were just trolls. We shouldn't trust that like it's the new generation of YouTubers. <laughs> you have to play by the rules. Fuck the rule. New rule, if someone claims to be a hippie and a leader, they're a hypocrite. Or a hippie crit. <laughs> I don't claim to be either. Anarchy. If you want to go to war with the Ukraine and you still think you're anti-war, give me a fucking break. <laughs> the 1960s. Did the original hippies blow our one shot at rebellion? Or do all countercultural movements eventually get infiltrated? Ladies and gentlemen, the electric Kool-Aid acid test. Boom. Tom Wolf. Kind of thank you. I decoded that shit with the cipher for free for you all. Support the program. Check out the Patreon. The effort on the YouTube may wean as the summer comes up. But I love you guys. If you want free memes, check out Harry Schwan on Instagram. My knickers. Seriously, I do love you. I wouldn't be doing it without you. Where's that random soundboard at? I'm a ninja. My guard is forever up. Nick Muniz signing off. See you in seven short days. Peace.